What do you get if you cross a TV with a PC? Well, if the video's icon and title didn't give it away, you get one very heavy PC TV. So it's 1995 and Fujitsu ICL thought that what we all needed was a PC and a TV all in one. They brought this machine to market through the UK retailer Toys R Us and it would only cost you a not so insignificant £1500. But according to a press release I found in The Independent, ICL's market research suggests young families will buy it as a second set for kids to use as a television and the whole family to use as a computer. But surely Fujitsu ICL had bigger plans for what was supposedly Europe's first PC and TV all in one. Perhaps the TV advertisement that was released alongside this thing will shed some light into how Fujitsu seen this thing fitting into our lives. It's only 40 seconds long so let's take a quick look. The only thing that advert tells me is that Fujitsu ICL had no idea whatsoever how to market this thing. And considering I had never heard of it until finding this amongst the big mother load pickup, well I can only assume it didn't do that well either. So let's see just how much PC and TV you get for £1500 back in 1995. And that's not me suggesting that I know everything about every computer ever made, far from it. Rather, what I mean by that is that you'd think for something as odd as this, well, there would be more information about it available online. Because other than a couple of articles, including that one I referenced from The Independent, and a listing for this thing being in the Centre for Computing History, well, I can't find anything else about this online. But it is exactly as you see. The bottom half of it here is a PC and this bit is a 14 inch colour stereo TV. You get a CD drive, floppy drive, typical sort of TV controls and just the one power switch. On the side of the machine then you get a game port, headphone jack and a microphone input. Obviously with no headphones in there, the sound comes out of the TV speakers. The back of the machine, well, that's where all the action is. This top half being the TV, well, that gives us our aerial input to the tuner, although that's analogue only, and all those services are long since switched off here in the UK. The input jack there is a bit mangled as well, although we could maybe try and get an RF input from one of the old consoles into that. Speaking of which, we also get options for composite input and output, so we could definitely try hooking something up to that. And there's also SCART. Power connects here, and yes, just the one power lead supplying both the PC and the TV. Only a maximum current there of three and a half amps. That doesn't seem that much considering everything that's being driven in here. There's our 1995 date. There did used to be a sticker here that had information about a pot testing on it. So from that I would guess that this particular PC TV, well, it must have been used in some sort of commercial environment. And then the back of the PC itself. 
Well, you do get a separate VGA cable that's going up into the TV. And at a guess, the reason they did it like that was in case you wanted to stick a different graphics card into one of the three available expansion slots. We have onboard parallel, two serial, and then your typical PS2 for mouse and keyboard. Not 100% sure what this one's for. It's an input of some sort, possibly line in, but it does share the same two little circles symbol there, as you can find on the TV inputs. And then there's just this big hole in the back of the case. Well, the two lock symbols, that probably gives it away. There used to be a cylindrical lock in here, which was securing the PC to the case. In fact, anyone who watched the original Motherload pickup videos where I initially showed this machine, you'll know that we weren't able to get inside this thing for a look because I couldn't get this open. But some very gentle persuasion later, I forced the lock out of there and we're able to get the PC out just by gripping at the sides and pulling. So given that we're working with a date of 1995, what sort of specification do you think we have got in here? Early Pentium, you know this is a multimedia system, PC and TV and all that. Well, that's what I was expecting, but what I found in here instead, 486DX266, and an IBM Blue Lightning at that. That's a Sarex chip. It seems that Fujitsu couldn't even spring to an Intel processor. So could that be part of the reason for a bit of a failure here? In the PC TV, it's PC bit for 1995 is maybe left a little bit wanting. Now it does have 8 megabytes of RAM and there's even a very nice riser card there, 3 ISA and 1 VLB. But by this time period, well for £1500, I certainly would have been expecting at least a DX4 and maybe a PCI slot or two for some better expansion options. But there is space for some improvement. Space for another two memory modules here. So we could see about doubling up the RAM could be taken up to 16 megabytes. There are those ISA slots and the VLB as I mentioned. Although I don't really have anything to put into them. Well, maybe other than a network card, because everything else is pretty well covered. The onboard VGA, well, it isn't anything special. It's only got one megabyte of RAM. Looks as if there may be room here to expand that, although it's using some sort of proprietary memory expansion module. And the chip itself is from Saris Logic. So certainly not the worst thing in the world, I dare say it will be able to power its way through any of the DOS games that we're going to be throwing at it. On the riser card itself then, well that's where the sound card lives. And that's coming to us courtesy of an analog devices sound port chip here. And also this Mozart IC from Oak Technology. CD-ROM IDE is derived from the riser as well, presumably as part of that sound card. And there's even an option here for a Sony CD drive. No surprises over here, we've got a Fujitsu hard drive. There's the IDE CD drive and hiding in there is the floppy. I will strip this down in a minute to give you a better look at everything, but one thing I can also see on the motherboard, which extends quite a bit underneath these drives, is some L2 cache. That's all the components out of the case, our drives, the motherboard and that riser card. The hard drive, 
Fujitsu model number AM2682TAM. Well, unfortunately, the disappointment continues here. This is only 352 megabytes. I actually thought I was maybe getting the dates wrong. Maybe this is actually earlier than 1995. But nope, 1995, January. This machine is definitely 95. That is a small hard drive for that date. Floppy drive from Panasonic, 1.44 megabytes. And that leads on to our CD drive, dated February 1995. I was calling this IDE, and it may well be that is the case, certainly looks like it, but this is also a Panasonic drive. And that connector on our riser card, that's labelled Panasonic as well. Not 100% sure if those drives are to the IDE standard or if it's proprietary. You can now see that cache RAM on the motherboard and it is configured here as 256K. We have a VIA chipset and our board is a model number 486-GACV. Now I did look that up and all the information about this board is available online. Printed onto the silk screen down here. Don't know if you'll be able to make that out or not. But it suggests there that the fastest processor we could put in here is indeed a DX2. But according to the motherboard manual I found, this board will indeed support a DX4 and even a Pentium overdrive. One thing is missing though, and that is a voltage regulator that needs to go on here. So those holes there would need cleared out, that jumper removed, and a voltage regulator put in place to bring the core voltage from 5 volt down to 3.3 for the DX4 or the Pentium overdrive. That may be an upgrade route to look at in the future, but for today we're just stuck with the DX266. The board does have the 8 megabyte of RAM, as I said, but supposedly it will support up to a maximum of 64. Our BIOS, our keyboard controller, and just a typical AT power connector. Battery's dead, so I'm going to swap that out with another coin cell type battery. But what I think I'll do, rather than just mount it to the board here, because that is buried underneath the drives, what I think I'll do is stick a couple of wires on that and extend it out remotely so that we could get to it easier to change it again in the future if we ever needed to. And just to give you one closer look at this riser card. What an absolutely gorgeous looking piece of kit this is. Complete with its built in sound card. The analog devices chip, well that handles the Windows sound system and DOS. The Mozart chip, that's essentially a Sound Blaster clone. Although according to a video I seen on Phil's computer lab where he covered a sound card that had these two on it. Supposedly this thing when running as a Sound Blaster Pro will only output mono audio, not stereo. It does feature the genuine Yamaha OPL chip though. And our riser has that nice VLB port. So if I could find another VLB graphics card, we could always stick it in there. Although I'm not sure if that would be any faster than what's down here. Be interested to know actually if that is sitting on the VLB bus or just the ISA bus. I think we'll be able to run a little benchmarking tool later that might tell us. I'm just in the middle of reassembling the machine so that we can take a look at it working. But before I put the drives in here, let me show you what I've done with this battery. So you can see there the old battery has been removed. I just installed a set of wires through to one of those coin cell holders in which we're going to stick a CR2032. And in case you're thinking I should have a diode in here, well, don't worry. There's one on the motherboard already. That original battery must not have been rechargeable. That's what that diode's there for. 
to stop the motherboard when powered up, putting voltage into the battery to stop the battery exploding. So I'm gonna go ahead and reassemble everything. Once I get the drive bays in, I'll just attach this to the side of them with a bit of double-sided sticky tape. Then we can test this machine. But it's all well and good testing a machine from 95 now in 2021. One thing I always enjoy hearing is other people's experiences using these machines back in the day. Well, speaking last night to the Goldfish from Goldfish on Games, he briefly had the chance to use one of these machines back in 1999. So yes, four years after this was originally released, but nevertheless, he used it back in the day and he has very kindly agreed to share some of his experiences. I got to experience the machine in the summer of 1999. And as you can imagine, if it was outdated when it launched, it was massively outdated by that point. But I was on my summer holidays, I was visiting my dad, and he decided it would be a great machine to get. Because he could watch the TV on it, and I could play some games. And what did I play on it? Well, it had to have been the Star Trek games, which was the 25th anniversary as well as Judgment Rights. So I whiled away my summer holiday playing those games on that tiny little trackball, as well as trying to use the remote as you could actually move the mouse around and do inputs with the remote. It wasn't very good, and it would miss quite a lot of your inputs, but it was quite fun to do. And to be honest, that remote was the most important part of that machine, as most of the controls were found on it, not on the machine itself. And it was because of that remote that the computer was eventually gotten rid of, because it broke and he couldn't work out how to control the rest of the machine without it. It's a bit of a shame as I would have loved to have gotten my hands on it, because it is a cool little device. But it was not to be. So he does raise a really good point, doesn't he? Because what's the one thing, or well, what's the two things that are missing from the picture? The keyboard with its integrated trackball stroke joystick and the remote control. I don't have either of them. Now, we do have those two PS2 ports on the back of the machine, so one PS2 keyboard and mouse later. That hopefully replaces the keyboard, but what about that remote control? Well, I have tried just your generic universal remote, and this one anyway doesn't work with this. But luckily enough, I figured out that when you power the machine up, the volume buttons, if you push both of them together, it switches the input over to the PC. CMOS check some error. Well, we've got that battery in there now, so let's jump into the BIOS and get that set up. So we'll just go into standard settings. Interesting that it defaults there to January 1st, 1994. This is definitely a 95 machine. But it is currently 2021. It's not quite December yet when I'm recording this. It is Monday, the 29th of November. And currently the time is about a quarter to nine. We can auto detect the hard drive, I'll do that in a minute. There only is the one floppy drive, so we'll turn that one off. And you can see it confirms there our total 8 megabytes of memory. There's a hard drive, just 335 megabytes. Now there's it set in there now. BIOS features. External cache is enabled. Boot sequence AC, I think I'll just leave it like that. Just leave all the rest of this as it is. Chipset features. Yeah, I think I will just leave all of this as well. Power management, just fairly typical. I'm actually just looking through here to see if there's anything to do with the TV in that uh, BIOS. But there doesn't seem to be, so let's just save. An exit. System starts booting DOS. 
and we're heading into Windows for Workgroups version 3.11. Or, well, not quite, because when the system does first boot up, it dumps you into this. Your typical mid-90s front end for one of these pre-built systems. This one is called the Den. And like any of these, it just shows you a picture of a room with various elements within it. And clicking on any of those will take you to the corresponding program within Windows. But I am not really a fan of these things. I personally think they just get in the way. So Alt F4. Let's just browse through Windows like this. Now the current resolution is set to 800 by 600. And for whatever reason, whatever refresh rate the graphics card in this thing runs at, at that resolution, my capture card really doesn't like it. You miss quite a bit of the side and bottom of the screen. So what I'm going to do is just quickly change the resolution to 640 by 480. Then we can move over to the capture card and it'll let you see more clearly what's going on with this system. So the first thing I want to have a quick look at is the file manager. And let's see if we can't figure out where this machine spent its life. Well, there is not a lot going on in here, is there? Other than the typical directories, we have Encarta, the encyclopedia, we have MS Works. A few files in here. What's the first one? Catherine Rowan 8P script. That makes me think, that 8P, that makes me think this might come from a school. There's Catherine's work of art. I'll not bother reading the script. I'll just wait for the film to be released. And given that we only have works and Encarta, I would hazard a guess that this machine maybe spent its life in the likes of a school library. We do have a directory here, I collapse, wonder what that is. Obviously something to do with the TV, auto tune, TV tune, executables. We're gonna come back to that. A PC TV directory, center, that is probably that awful front end. Mozart, that would be the sound card drivers. CL mode, what does that do? Ah, it's like a utility for the graphics card. Video modes. It certainly supports quite a lot of them. User database, that's probably related to that front end again. In fact, yep, I would say that's exactly what it is. Utilities, don't know what that is. And just the Windows directory. Yeah, so not a lot going on in our little machine. Microsoft applications. Yeah, it's just Encarta and works. Accessories. Nothing much to see there. That's all the standard stuff. Main. That's where we were. Games. Well, it's only got Solitaire and Minesweeper. Startup. The Den. Delete. Thank you. That'll just stop that running every time I start this machine. And then the interesting bit, PC TV applications. This is the bit that you wanted to see. Let's start up here. Sound stack. So it has a CD player, digital recorder. I'm going to assume that's for MIDI files, WAV files, stuff like that. And then our volume control. Let's try a CD. Anyone for a bit of rock set? So I can't play too much of that, but there's something wrong there, isn't there? The sound is cutting in and out. Wonder could that be a problem with the CD drive itself? Or I suppose that disc is a bit scratched. So as you heard, it wasn't playing this CD back, the audio was skipping, but 
The machine has been sitting running here now for a good half an hour. And if we try that CD again. You can hear there that it's now playing back fine. So why would it do that? When it's initially powered on, the drive struggles to read discs. But after the machine's been running for a while, it seems to read them fine. I think that could be a sign of failing capacitors in here. It takes them to warm up before they come back into their spec or close enough to it anyway that the drive reads okay. I suppose it could also be a failing laser, but once the drive has warmed up, it never misses. It reads everything you put in there. Yep, still playing it fine. But let's just go through the other PC TV applications quickly. The filing cabinet. Well, it just seems to be somewhere that you would store files, strangely enough. Somebody's bitmap nicked. No idea. But it comes from this machine's previous life. The TV channel controller. Well, this is where it starts to get more interesting. Because this is what we're going to use to try and set up the TV. Now, we're going to need something to give us a signal. And so for that, I'm just going to use the old Atari 2600. We can get RF out of here. So the console is all hooked up. Let's just turn that on. And then on the PC, let's try and retune. So it's just scanning through all the various frequencies. Hopefully it will find the Atari. And there it is. So it has saved that to channel 1. It's now searching for a channel 2. Auto switches us back to the PC. Now it's trying to find a name for that channel. I doubt it will find anything from the Wii console. Unnamed underscore one. Well, if we double click on that, we can give it a name. Let's just call it RF. We can even view. And there it is. What about if we try to add another input? How about onto the AV in? What could we use for that? How about a Sega Saturn? A period correct console connected to our 1995 PC TV. So we'll just turn the Saturn on. There's no disc in it, but it would launch to that sort of splash screen that all these consoles from this era had. How are we going to get it up on the TV though? Just try retune again. Well, there's the Atari. And away it goes trying to retune everything. Okay, it's found the Atari again, which I fully expected. And I'm sort of hoping that at the end of this, it'll check those AV inputs and find the Saturn. And that would be a no. It's only found the one channel again, which is the RF. The 2600. Without the remote control, how do we change the TV to its AV inputs? Well, I have been screwing around with this for far too long. There is seemingly no way to change the thing over to its AV input, presumably without the remote control. Been through the help file, it is completely useless. Been through the entire DEN tutorial, 
it does tell you how to set up this program and to do the tuning doesn't mention anything about AV. One thing I did find out though is that there's a keyboard shortcut. So if you go Control, Alt and T, that changes you over to the TV. Control, Alt and T brings you back to the PC. I've tried Control, Alt and everything else. I did find Control, Alt and S puts the TV in the standby. But Control Alt and all the rest of those keys do absolutely nothing. Interestingly, when you take it out of standby, the TV shortcut no longer works. Went out and bought another all-in-one universal remote control just on the off chance. But no, that doesn't do anything either. So I'm afraid we're beat. Seemingly no way to get AV without the original remote. Oh well. Live Mag then, that's the other unique application to this system. And all this does is allow you to browse teletext, albeit without an analog terrestrial TV signal coming into this thing, carrying the teletext signal, well, there's nothing I can show you. Reminders is fairly self-explanatory. You're just setting up an alarm, effectively. The tutorial is pretty much useless. I went right through this, trying to figure out how to use the AV inputs. Doesn't even mention them. And equally, this technical notes help file, there is not much in the way of useful information in here. Certainly, again, nothing to do with those AV inputs. I've also tried every combination of these buttons down here to see if I can switch it over to AV, but nope. It does not want to know. Pressing those two switches between the TV and the PC. I thought maybe with the AV connected, pressing it again would take you into that, but no, it doesn't. Oh well. But what about the PC side of our PC TV? Just how well does it perform? So if we just restart the machine, and I'm just going to hold down shift here, so that that just boots straight to the DOS prompt. Then we can run the DOS benchmark pack from Phil's computer lab. I want to check out SpeedSys, just to see how fast our little system is running. So that's not particularly fast, is it? Memory bandwidth? 24.39 megabytes a second. That seems pitifully low. That cannot be right. Surely that cannot be right. Our other 46DX266 system, which actually has the same processor in it. Well, it was scoring, what, about 150 megabytes a second in bandwidth. This does confirm, though, that our graphics card there, the Cyrus Logic, is sitting on the Visa bus. And that throughput, 8 megabytes a second, or well just slightly under it, 8000k a second, that's not too bad really. That in itself is certainly faster than the Visa Local Bus card that we have in the other 46 rig. Processor benchmark scores 28.77, pretty typical for this chip. It's sitting just above the Intel 46DX250, that's sort of where you would expect it. And then the memory test, finally done, L1 cache, 8K, that is on the processor. 51.58 megabytes a second, flying along. The L2 cache, all 256K of it, that's on the motherboard, 38.67 megabytes a second, not too bad. And then that memory throughput, a mere 21.21 megabytes a second. I do think that could be better. Unfortunately though, it seems that within our BIOS, well, there's nothing that we can really tweak. There's certainly no chipset timings that we can change. Unless there's some jumpers on the motherboard to configure that. 
about the only thing we can do is cache timing control while it's on fast. We can stick it to turbo. And okay, in fairness, it has lifted that figure a very small amount. Still absolutely nowhere near the bandwidth that the other 46 machines get. Yeah, that didn't really make any change to the L1 cache or the memory throughput. But changing that option to turbo has lifted the speed of the L2 cache by quite a bit. I swapped out the memory and added another two sticks. I had the four matching, so I thought, why not? This memory is rated at 60 nanoseconds. The previous stuff was rated at 70. These are still four megabyte modules each, so 16 meg in total now. Albeit that slight speed increase going from 70 to 60. Well, to be honest with you, I don't think it will make a button of difference whatsoever. Although I suppose it's worth sticking them in there. In terms of the jumpers, well, I've had a look through the manual and there doesn't really seem to be anything to do with memory timings. I did find one jumper, JL1, which is located on the other side of that riser card. It's for setting a weight state, presumably, for the memory. In position 1, 2, which is the default though, those weight states are set to 0. Moving it to 2, 3 introduces a weight state of 1. And it is set to position 1, 2 on here. But if anything, we've doubled the amount of memory in here, and sure, that can only be a good thing. So let's just try this again. I don't think it will make a button of difference, but you never know. Yep, memory bandwidth, more or less the same, 25.75 megabytes a second. To be honest with you, I'm starting to think that sys speed here is just giving us a false uh, reading there. Because surely it has to be faster than that. And the machine itself it seems to be running fine. It's not like it's having any issues. It doesn't seem to be sluggish. It actually seems to be quite fast for a DX266. Because if we run the likes of Duke Nukem. Well, it does take a minute or two to load, but when it does finally get into the demo, it runs fine. Or, well, as fine as you would expect on a DX266. say the performance here is very similar to the performance on the other 486 build. And then just finally, because I know some people will want to see it, there is the inside of the TV. So the tube is by JVC. And yes, on those universal remote controls, I have tried all the codes for JVC as well as Fujitsu. Unfortunately, none of those work either. Power supply for the machine sits here vertically. There's the two speakers away back here. And this sort of logic board sitting vertically here, well, it is branded ICL. And it's that which is handling the RF the AV inputs and also the VGA. It's really hard to get a good shot of that board. I don't really want to have to strip all this down, but you can see a bit more of it there. That large black cable there running into it, that is the VGA signal. So the PC TV, that's about all I can really show you today. It is definitely a bit of an oddball, although you could call it a relic of its time. Early to mid 90s, well, 
all the various hardware manufacturers were trying to come up with the new greatest idea to sell their product Fujitsu ICL they thought why not stick a TV on the top of a PC just didn't seem to work out for them could that be though the specification of that PC the X266 and only 8 megabytes of RAM that fairly small hard drive as well the press release suggested that they were pushing this thing towards kids to use as a TV for parents to use as a PC well as the goldfish told us from his experience it was the other way around and I would have to agree with that I would say it would be more the kids would want to play the games on the PC and the parents use the TV and that PC well it's specification in 1995 you know if you got this thing late 95 you're going to want to use it as your main computer for a couple of years by that point it's already out of date this thing is definitely not going to run games from 96 97 as soon as likes a quick came out well you have no chance whatsoever even Duke 3D that we've seen there was struggling on this system it is a bit of a shame that I don't have the matching keyboard or maybe more so that remote control as without that it seems the TV side of things is fairly limited certainly these days what we'd more want to use that TV for is its AV inputs and without that remote it unfortunately seems like we're beat the only other one of these machines that I know to exist is held in the Center for Computing History and I did reach out to those guys and in all fairness to them Adrian over there thank you very much sir he did go and have a look and they don't have the remote control either so if by chance anybody watching this video has one of these machines and has that remote control well I would love to get it off you to clone its features onto one of those universal remotes or if you even couldn't get it to me if you could get it to the Center for Computing History those guys would be very uh, grateful for it as they do have the machine with its keyboard and all its documentation the only thing missing is that remote but that is it for this video so hopefully you enjoyed this look at the Fujitsu ICL PC TV as strange as it is I do think it is a fascinating little computer I want to say a massive thank you again to the goldfish for participating in this video I'll leave links to his channel in the description down below make sure you go and check him out he does pretty awesome game reviews and no doubt you will have seen the hashtag December 2021 this video forms part of that whole bunch of us on YouTube getting together again this year to put out a lot of content concentrating on classic DOS type machines so again in the video description I'll leave a link to the playlist but that is it from me for now so thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time